Hair fashion in the 1870s was a time of exuberance and artificiality minutely detailed in the pages of Harper's Bazaar. By 1871, the fashionable silhouette had changed dramatically from the mid-1860s. Huge bell-shaped gowns and small heads gave way to heavy draping and bustles emphasizing the derriere, with hairstyles taking on a similar monumental rear focus. False hair pieces gained popularity as hairstyles became larger and more ornate. Hairdressers promoted styles requiring hair pieces because they were highly profitable. The best quality hair for wigs was found among the rural peasantry of Europe. Women of all ages would auction their hair for a pittance, usually receiving only a length of cloth, a cheap ornament, or a pair of shoes for several years' growth. By the time their hair was sold as finished hair pieces, it could cost more than an American steel worker earned in a year. Hair pieces had always been helpful to women suffering baldness, but many fashionable styles were impossible without them, even on the best upholstered heads. False hair became an indispensable piece of splendor, if never entirely respectable. Harper's Bazaar satirists routinely lampooned the use of false hair, these cartoons give us insights to the challenges of acquiring and wearing false hair. It wasn't necessary to live in a big city to buy false hair. One had only to mail a hair sample, along with payment, to one of any number of vendors, and a color-matched hairpiece would be returned by post. Since mail-ordered hair could not be tried on, the sample that one sent was critical to the matching process. Inadequate samples could result in nasty surprises, especially when one sent hair cut from the tips only, rather than an entire strand cut near the scalp. Such a predicament is related in the cartoon, A Dreadful Accident. What is the matter? Why, Clara's new chignon has come home half an hour before the Doddleston's dance, and it is at least five shades lighter than the rest of her hair. Clara, when she sent off her sample, didn't account for the fact that the tips of natural long hair are always lighter in color than the root. The difference in color between Clara's own hair and the hairpiece would be comparable to that between light brown and lightest blonde. Women wearing false hair were subject to sudden social indignity because hair pieces were prone to slip off during vigorous activity, especially dancing much to the delight of impertinent gentlemen. And hairpins weren't always up to the task of keeping both a woman's coiffure and her hair ornaments in place. With these pitfalls duly noted, I find that a most convenient style for the lady adventurous time traveler is one worn in the early 1870s, comprised of a thick false braid on top of the head with tumbling curls in the back these curls can be made from the natural hair or false hair, as one pleases. Personally, I prefer false pin curls because they may be made in advance and kept in one's time traveling case until needed, obviating the necessity of curling one's own stiff, unyielding tresses. Being a seasoned time traveler, I not only feel the privilege but the obligation to employ the most advanced materials available to me, to wit, Synthetic braiding hair in whatever color I like. Thank you very much. Before commencing, I supply myself with small rubber bands, straight pins, end papers, and a variety of cylindrical devices around which to wrap my synthetic tresses. After removing synthetic hair from packaging, Pinch a small amount from the hank and pull it away. Smooth the lengths. Tie a single knot at the center of the strand. Grasp just below the knot. and bind just below the knot with a small elastic. Take a flexible foam curling cylinder, vulgarly known as a bender, and attach the knot to one end with a straight pin. Mm -hmm. 
smoothly wind the hair around the curler. Wrap one or more curl papers around the tips of the hair and secure the paper with a straight pin. Wind as many strands as desired. To set the curl, drop the hair wrapped curlers into scalding hot water. Assure that the hair becomes thoroughly saturated. Remove the curlers with tongs and permit them to cool. Remove the pins and papers and unwind the hair from the curlers. Gentle listeners will kindly note that synthetic hair takes the precise shape of the object upon which it is wrapped and any defect in said wrapping will blemish the resultant curl. As in penmanship, neatness counts. To construct the very elegant false braid, one will need a full hank of synthetic braiding hair, 18 inches of ribbon, a strong spring clamp, scissors, and several small rubber bands. Attach the clamp to the edge of your work table facing you. Slip the ribbon under the binding band of the hank of hair and tie the ribbon into a loose loop using a bow knot. Hook the loop over the handle of the clamp. Tie a single knot at the center of the hank. Smooth out the strands. Divide the hank into three strands. And begin braiding. Braid nearly to the ends of the hair. Bind the ends tightly with a couple of small elastic bands. Cut off the disorderly ends of the hair near the elastics. Remove the loop from the clamp and the ribbon from the hank. Tightly band the hair below the knot at the point where the braid is one's desired length. Cut off the knot and the unwanted extra length. It is finally time to dress my head. To avoid confusion, I shall set up my dressing table before commencing. I shall have combs, brushes, a variety of long, robust U-shaped wire hairpins, some water and pomade for flyaways. I shall have already inserted hairpins into the knots of all my curls and will lay them out from long to short, left to right. This shall be the order in which I attach them to my hair. I shall first comb out my hair and divide the front from the back with an ear to ear parting. I shall knot up the front hair to keep it out of the way, since I must, of necessity, dress the back hair first. Mm -hmm. 
I shall now French braid my back hair all the way to the tips, applying water as necessary to make them more obedient. I secure the ends with an unobtrusive elastic band. I shall wind the braid around the back of my head so it lays close and flat. I secure it with only a few wire hairpins. It will serve as foundation for all of the pin curls. I shall now insert the pin curls near the nape of my neck, placing the longest one first in rows of four across the back of my head. I pin into the braided bun for maximum hold. I continue pinning in rows of four across the back. As I go higher, the gradually shortening pin curls create a pleasing waterfall effect. I stop pinning once I reach the top of the braided bun near the crown. The shortest curls shan't be inserted until later. I now let down the front hair. And make a center parting. I lay on the crown braid. and join the two ends at the back and pin. I shall lift one side of the front hair and lightly back comb it, both to create pleasing fullness and so that it will stay in place better. I shall wind the ends around my finger and pin this curl just inside the braid crown, which is a cunning way of hiding the unsightly ends of the artificial braid. I shall, of course, repeat this operation on the other side. The side hair will partially conceal the crown braid. Finally, I shall artfully attach the shortest pin curls onto the crown of my head.
I always check for balance and symmetry. And the style is now complete.